Welcome to episode 58 of the Series About Security podcast for October 2nd, 2013, brought to you by the Center for Education and Research and Information Assurance and Security, or Sirius at Purdue University. Again, I'm joined by Keith Watson and Mike Hill. I'm Preston Wiley, and uh, Mike will talk about the first topic for this podcast. Thank you, Preston. Uh, one article came out this week talking about the uh, Los Angeles School District's initiative to uh, deploy iPads in all of their schools. It's part of an overall $1 billion initiative, so they're making quite a hefty investment into these devices. Uh, but what they've learned is that less than a week, this kind of reminds me of our last podcast where we're talking about how quickly can things be hacked, uh, the students already found a way to bypass the software. Um, probably not real surprising that they, they found a way to do that. And uh, apparently some students are even charging $2 uh, to other students to go ahead and hack, hack their iPads. Um, unless you're friends, and then for friends they'll, they'll cut you a break and do it for free. Uh, so I, I thought this was a very interesting article. Um, I actually have a daughter that just went into high school this year, and in her high school, uh, they didn't issue iPads, they issued tablet computers that they have to carry with them everywhere. So um, one of the things I remember being told at, at the parent orientation was, we have a lot of confidence in, in these devices, and um, we're going to run security software that lets us know what the kids are doing, when they're doing it, we're going to restrict access, and we feel confident. And, and it's a similar scenario here with the LA schools. They are running security software on there, and the idea is that uh, the school should be able to know at all times where the iPad is and what's being run on it. Uh, it limits things like Facebook and Twitter, social media apps from being used. Um, however, uh, in the article it describes the fact that that's the problem. iPads are a lot of fun, and, and kids have grown up with these devices being fun devices and they know what they're capable of, and they don't want to just use them for learning, which can be boring to, to high school students. They want to have fun with them. Uh, so they've sidestepped the security software for now, um, and they're basically running them unlimited, uh, kind of how the iPad was designed to be used. Um, some of the response from the LA school district, because they've got such a huge investment in it, is they're going to research ways to, make, to lock them down even more. Um, I, I don't know. This is where I think we can have a lot of debate about it. You know, I don't know how much you can lock down these types of devices. Um, I think kids with physical access are going to find a way around it. Ultimately, they're going to find ways to um, to break the device. Now, maybe it, maybe it becomes a policy thing. You know, maybe the software become can become smart enough. It knows when it's been turned off. It sends a you know, a, a homing signal back, and when that device stops doing that, you go and track down that student, you go, what'd you do? You, there's going to be a penalty for what you did, because we didn't get the five-second ping from your device that we expected, so we know you did something to alter it, or, you know, we're going to take possession of it, and there's going to be a penalty. Um, beyond that, though, I don't, you know, this is a huge investment for, for the LA schools. But I don't see this being a problem that goes away. I mean, yes, I am sure there's going to be a rollout of new software that fixes this gap. But I, I really feel confident there's going to be another gap. I think it's just going to exist. There's a motive there. There's physical access. You can hook them up, and you can get in. You can find ways around it. Um, so what do you guys think? Do you think this is doable? Do you think there's a solution in place for the LA schools? Well, it sounds like the software they chose to secure the devices were, was not that sophisticated because apparently the hack was that the students would delete their profile and then magically this protective <laughs> software didn't work after that. Um, so that doesn't exactly sound like a very strong way of doing it. But part of the problem is with, with the iPad, iOS in particular, it's not really a multi-user system. And as there's no multi-user restrictions, uh, it's a little difficult to have uh, security software that doesn't modify the operating system significantly to provide the right kind of protections. And um, that's a little different on the Android with the modern version. There's the multi-user profile approach with that. Um, 
So I know why they chose the iPad, mostly because there's a lot of software available for it, a lot more of their curriculum that's been converted to use iOS versus the other devices that are available. So I can see why they chose it. But it's still going to be pretty difficult to secure that kind of device, even with, without physical access to it. Um, the software is not really designed to have additional security features built into it for more than just the primary user of the device. Yeah, well, in one thing I thought was interesting, again, as a parent of a high schooler now, we got a huge bill you know, at registration to sign up. Um, and they're still, and they're in this transition phase, as I imagine a lot of schools are right now. So not only does you have to have the tablet, but you have to have you know, hundreds of dollars worth of books. And, and to me, as a parent, see, we don't own that tablet at all. We're, we're renting it. I mean, if something happens to it, you know, it's like a $1,200 charge to us. I know, yeah, for a tablet that is like four years old, right? So yeah, it, as an IT guy, it, it's a little frustrating. What I prefer, I think they're taking the wrong approach here. I think it should become, you're allowed to bring your device in. You're allowed to do certain things with your device. But let's get back to old school manners here. I mean, really how difficult is it? If you're teaching a class, you're looking out there and someone's, and you go behind their desk and say, hey, get off Facebook. Go to the, go to the principal's office. I mean, do we need all the technology? We're using technology with the technology to monitor the technology. I think it gives a false sense of security. You know, because there's always ways around it in the past, right? I mean, when we were kids, right? They had the, you know, the, just a handheld video games were coming out. Come on, some of you guys didn't have friends that brought them to school. I did, you know? And they got caught. Some got caught, some didn't, you know? They got confiscated. The guy that snuck in the calculator watch for the, for the math exam. Hey, you can't be doing that. I mean, you know, yeah, we didn't have technology back then to say, oh, there's a calculator watch in the room. So, I mean, are we making it too complicated? iPads can be a great resource, but let's just be aware. Let's say you can use any device you want. You know, you have to have a, you have to have some kind of tablet or, or you know, tablet, um, and you have it has to be able to meet, it has to be able to run this app. You know, maybe the app's available on Google Play, and it's available on iOS, maybe even on Windows, and so you can bring your own device. We're not going to tell you what device you need to have. Uh, we can help you lease one if you need that. If you have your own personal device or you want to get your child their own personal device, they can bring it to the school and they can use it. In fact, the one article ends with that. that one of the students says, you know, uh, she doesn't even bother using the iPad. She just uses her own personal iPhone 5 to do the work. Probably because it doesn't have all the overhead, all the restrictions. She can just go to it. She can do the work and she can, you know, check her email and do all the other things that come with the device. Well, from uh, from the perspective of the school, um, you know, from a, if if, there, if it, kids at school, you have they have to access they have to have access to a network. And from the network standpoint, you can lock down where they can go, what they can do, and all that from within the school. I think what what the school's concerned about is what they're doing outside of school, and I'm not sure how much how much really influence they should have as far as outside of school. That should be more of, uh, you know, the parents on, on the parents. But, 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 it's school but, issue. but on the other hand, if yeah. the school is issuing these right. these devices, then they have a, they, you know, maybe they do have a little bit of responsibility on ensuring that the students aren't doing things they shouldn't be doing outside of school. But it's kind of one of those Right, you know, if you're issuing these, and so there's going to be some parents that say, well, if you're issuing these to my kid, then you should be somewhat responsible on what they do with them. And I think so, that's it. I, I think there's a, I, I think um, there's a strong culture for that. And I believe, and that's sort of how our school presented to us. You know, we are issuing these tablets for the first time to freshmen. Uh, you know, it's been an initiative they've been under for four years, and it's like. Uh, so this is the first time through the freshmen are going to have this. Uh, don't worry, we put mechanisms in place to uh, to prevent certain things. And I'm sitting there kind of going, well, you know, I, I got my daughter a laptop like a year ago. She, you know, I've got the things in place there, and, and a lot of it's acceptable use. You know, a lot of it is her, you know, using the laptop in a public mm -hmm. place within the house. So you know, shoulder surfing, going, what are you doing over there? You know, um, again. 
there's some of that factor. And, and I, I accept that responsibility as the parent. I don't necessarily want the school to be the parent in the situation. I don't think it's a, um, I don't think they can maintain that role. Um, and by issuing the devices, so I think they are, they're, you know, they're going to be accountable for that. I mean, if someone does something illegal on a school issued iPad, does the school become responsible now because they issued it? Does the parent, can the parent then sue the school and say, well, if you hadn't given them this device, they wouldn't have been able to do it, even though the school would not have authorized, you know, an illegal transaction with that device. So yeah, I think it's a sticky situation uh, that they're in here. Well, I, don't, I, I think it's one of these problems where they, it sounded like a good idea. Somebody got excited by the technology, and there was a really good sales guy involved somewhere. And I don't think this is a fully, I don't think having technology in the classrooms is yet fully thought out from start to finish, as well as the risks and what the, what the kids are going to gain from an education perspective at the end. I think they probably have a plan for some of that, but they've skipped over some major details. So I think it's an ill-conceived concept. Well, it seems like the idea is, you know, you can uh, save money on books. Da, da, da. Well, sure. But There's on the other hand, financial argument but, when, to it. but when you think about it, okay, I have a book, I drop it on the floor, the book's fine. Yes. You oh, I have an books. iPad, I drop it on. Oh, it's broken. Mm -hmm. It's broken. Yeah, and I can't use it anymore. So I need to pay on. another. You know, five, six hundred dollars, five or six hundred dollars for a new iPad or whatever. Oh man, that sucks. Yeah. Books don't cost. Well, I can't say books don't cost five or six. Well, college textbooks, at least. There's some high school textbooks. Well, those are still five. Cost a lot, but you know. But still, yeah. you drop it, it doesn't break. You know. Yeah. Right. Even if it does break. The binding may break or whatever. And it's still it's, useful. It's still usable. It's and it's a little duct tape. It's very fixable. So, but an iPad it drops and the yeah. screen breaks and well, whatever. The I think they're very works. early into the process. Um, <coughs> really, as education as a whole, we're in this early phase of technology because what we're trying to do is we're, we're trying to do things the old way with technology instead of innovating new ways to do things with technology. So basically they're, they're, they're just trying to swap out an iPad for a book, which is they're not a one-to-one -one in any way. The iPad can do so many different things. And it's like if, in your argument, if it was just a book replacement, then e-readers would have been sufficient. Yeah, yeah. But, yes. but there's other things they want them to do. There's other apps they want them to run, but they don't want them to do all the other stuff that um, that, the, that the students do want to use, you know, if they're going to have an iPad, they want to be able to, you know, check Facebook and do those. And, things. and the same argument can be made <laughs> for bring your own device in the corporate environment, and we go through that all yeah. the time. People buy their own device, they bring it to work, they connect it up to the work network, and now they want to be able to do whatever they want with their own device on right. a corporate network, and so that's. We haven't solved that problem in the enterprise. <laughs> I don't know why we'd expect to be able to solve that problem in school. In school so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it's going to be a long road ahead. I, I think it's interesting. I think it'll be a, a, a fun story to follow. Uh, but I don't see. I just don't see any way in the future. Um, you know, unless they totally seal up this whole entire thing. <laughs> well, then this yeah. is the from uh, this is the second largest school district in the country. Is that? Yeah. Is, that, is that correct? So, so this is it's a good test case. I'm guessing New York would probably be the first. New York might be the so, uh, yeah. so this is a lot of students and a lot of uh, probably a lot of headache for everybody involved. Well, it might so it might drive you know Apple's part of this deal. It might drive some changes within Apple. You know that they're, they're no. you don't think so? No, I think this is big enough. No, no, no. No, Maybe it used to be never. I think Apple's culture no, is changing. No, you don't think no, so? Change. No, change. No, and, and, and that's there. the thing. They're, 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 um, Apple, <laughs> Apple has nothing to do with the security of the system. Yeah, they're buying party. another right. party application to do it. So Apple's not even involved. Right. So, but we were talking about user profiles maybe adding another I mean, Android system. has user profiles. Microsoft has ways to lock things down and have multi-user access on their on their tablets and computers. But Apple, they have parental controls, I think, and that's that's what they've got. So, and I don't know how well they, how, how well they work or anything about them. So, yeah. Well... 
it, I think it all depends. It's, uh, I think it's all in how it's perceived and presented to them. If a perception exists that there's a lacking in iOS, I would think that they would try to address it. You don't know that full very well, do you? <laughs> no, I don't. I don't, honestly. But I would think um, some of their recent innovations, to me, have a bit of a flavor of Android. So I wouldn't be surprised, you know, that I, they wouldn't be that they would entertain. They're never going to say the idea came from there. Never. But it wouldn't surprise me if a similar feature wasn't introduced. But we'll see. We, we can always go back and watch this podcast two to three years from now and, and laugh. And well, I, think it, I think until, until <laughs> the latest version of Android, surprisingly, Apple might have been a little bit ahead on the parental control angle. But with Android 4.3, suddenly they have, you can have multiple users and you can lock down individual users. So. Yeah, so I think they might have moved. They went, they went from behind to way ahead. Just in one, well, in I'm one not route. sure I'm actually. Sure. About, so, I know they use profiles as a handy feature, but I don't remember too much the way of parental controls. Maybe that's through third party software, too. And maybe. I don't, I don't Which know. Which might be a little easier to implement on an Android device. Yeah, that could be. All right, well, we'll talk about the next. The next article, because we're running short on time, but this one's not, I don't think, quite as controversial or whatever. <laughs> um, is it? <laughs> I don't know. Well, this is about Silent Circle. Um, you may be familiar with them because we talked about them maybe a month ago. Uh, they, they used to have an anonymous email service, which they decided to shut down um, in the wake of the NSA revelations. But they're in the news again, uh, security news again, because they've also decided to stop using any NIST uh, ciphers uh, for doing any of their encryption. They provide, I guess, encrypted uh, voice and ch maybe chat services and things like that, and just encrypted services, real-time encryption, I think, video, conference calling. Conference calling and things like that. And uh, so they've, they've decided to move away from AES and SHA-2, which are NIST uh, standard ciphers, and I guess move over to TwoFish, and what's the, what's the hashing? Scheme. Scheme, the Scheme hash function, and the TwoFish uh, cipher suite that was written by Bruce Schneier, and was, was one of the finalists for the AES competition and didn't ultimately did not. And it was one of the finalists. So, so uh, I think that's interesting uh, that they're moving away from, they're, they're, they're not saying <coughs> directly that they don't trust the NSA. They just don't know what not to trust. So they're just assuming, they're just taking the, the, the tack that we will trust nothing that came out of NIST or the could have been influenced yeah, that, by the NSA. NSA could have had their hands in. So we're just going to avoid the entire thing and move away from anything that's related to NIST. So I thought this would be interesting to talk about. Well, it is interesting to note that you know you go back a couple of you know, well quite a few years. Uh, Blowfish, another Bruce Schneier algorithm, which has been reviewed many times and found to be a pretty strong algorithm is an example of one that is not approved by any government, yet for the longest time was included in a lot of uh, encryption software. It was uh, an algorithm that I think that he made publicly available or, or licensed it very inexpensively, but I think it was publicly available, you could use it. I think TrueCrypt supports it. TrueCrypt uh, might support that as well. Yeah. But then so. the government, through NIST, wanted to get a lot of products that would interoperate, hence we have the standards that NIST came up with for AES, DE, DES, and all the Shaw algorithms. So there was a, an effort by the government side to you know, kind of solidify and, uh, the various protocols and form some standards that everybody could implement to. Some of that was, but it's all supposed to be managed by NIST, but with influence from the NSA potentially and outside contractors as well, providing their own input. But we had algorithms like 
Blowfish, for example, and Whirlpool and Perhash algorithm. There's a, there's a couple others um, that are well known, have been reviewed through cryptographic research and literature. Cryptanalysts crypt have looked at them and found them to be pretty strong algorithms. So there's a lot of, of algorithms out there, like Two Fish, like Blowfish, like Scheme, where those have been well reviewed. They're pretty much trusted by the cryptographic community, but they're not government standard issue uh, algorithms. And so um, pretty much every product you see out there supports AES, and less products are supporting these non-government sanctioned, if you will, uh, algorithms. So there's nothing wrong with them. It's just, for whatever reason, this went in a different direction. So there's a lot of good algorithms out there that have been looked at and well-reviewed. And as long as programmers aren't writing their own crypto algorithms, because we know that's a bad idea. <laughs> uh, yeah. It's a good idea in some cases to, to use some of these, un not necessarily unapproved, but uh, just not formally sanctioned algorithms, such as Two Fish, Three Fish, Scheme. And uh, so those are, those are available. And maybe we'll see more, more products and service companies say, you know what, we don't need AES. We can do just fine with Two Fish. Well, and this is uh, something I commented before we started recording, is it looks like Silent Circle just does real-time encryption, voice, right, and, thing, and, and video, and things like that, and taking something that you already have encrypted and moving it to a different algorithm may be a bit more difficult because you would need essentially the space. If you have a lot of data, you would need the space to essentially decrypted and re-encrypted well, an algorithm. So true, but that, that's true of any anytime you have a large amount of data because due to uh, improvements in computation you may decide that uh, that the data we encrypted way back when in DES is no longer good enough and we need to re-encrypt everything with AES. Right. Or we need to change the key we use. Right. The key's been compromised. That's true. So you still have that, that problem yeah. of, of decrypting with the old and re-encrypting with the new. So that's that's more of an implementation problem. Yeah. But uh, I think in this case, we're talking about communications, which are temporary in nature. So you know, you have a set of strong, uh, a set of keys and strong algorithms that you're using just for that session. And then the key is forgotten and the, the encrypted data, um, nobody's stored unless you want to go to the NSA archive and dig it up. Yeah. Well, I have heard of two fish, but I've never heard of the scheme. I've never heard of the scheme function. So I believe that was a submission to the NIST hash algorithm okay. uh, competition to so the, the Shaw one. The Shaw replacement. Okay. Well, what's interesting about scheme and three fish is that John Callis, who was a co-author of those as well, um, which he's one of the founders of Silent Circle. So. Um, I don't know if it's relevant, but it, it may weaken their position just a little bit on that because they're changing to algorithms that he's worked on. So, um, well, he is you could also harder. you could see it. Well, and, and, but the question is, why not start by using those? Why change now? You know, it's it's a shot at again. NSA. It was probably, hey, we want to convince customers yeah. that we are using algorithms that they know and trust. We're going to we're going to choose NIST algorithms. Now, it's like, well, now there's this issue, a publicity issue, with those algorithms being in question, not necessarily having right. flaws, but being in question. It might be easier for us to sell to customers that are reluctant with, with government approved algorithms to use these other algorithms. Yeah. yeah. Kind of I, think I think this is well. somewhat of a business decision and a marketing yeah, thing. Yeah, totally. So, I can see it that way. Well, yeah, I'm just saying that you could also perceive that as, well, you're putting a lot of trust in them then. Why not pick one of the other algorithms that well, was not this, but they didn't have a hand in it? And for them, it's very easy to do. It's a change in software. <coughs> Apparently, two fish is a drop-in replacement for AES. Right. So it's really just, here you go, get our new app. Yeah, and it's, now yeah. using a it's a block cipher, and you can, you can that's the whole idea. You can pull one out and replace that algorithm with another one, so it shouldn't be too hard to do. Um, so, I think it's kind of a business decision. Like we said, it's it's you know if you want to attract new customers that are nervous about government involvement with government approved algorithms, that would be a way to do it. So yeah. we're not using them anymore. Yeah, it, it's it's interesting. It's interesting. I, it'll be um, 
you know, I wonder if others will follow suit in, in any manner. Because, you know, well, those the things that do not sell to the U.S. government may. If you sell the U.S. government, you have to implement the government standard algorithms. Well, you so, may be given a choice. You may be given a choice. <laughs> 21 years. That's right. No. But uh, I don't see RSA going out and saying, you know what, we're going to throw out all our AES implementations and replace it with two fish or some RSA algorithm that they built. Because they want to sell to the federal government, they're going to have to have They're going to have to have that in there. Yeah. But I, Silent Circle built its business on being anti-government. I mean, Phil Zimmerman is, yeah. is yeah. the guy. Yeah. How many times has he probably, uh, you know, they had a big prosecution against him for the longest time <laughs> in the ni early 90s. I don't think he's a big fan of the U.S. government, no matter who's in charge. Probably, <laughs> probably not. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just, you know, I think it's interesting because if you skim through it, if you look at it really quick, it's like, oh, is there something wrong with AES? Shaw to. They're not saying there is, but they're saying to avoid any perception there could be, we're not going to use right. it. The NSA could, influence, could have had an influence in this that we're just going to avoid that. So I, I, I think it's an interesting statement to make. It, it is all, you know, especially in the current climate. Um, well, I don't think Bruce Schneier has even said that the NSA has done anything that he has to make it. No, I don't think anybody said AES is I mean, an issue. The, the main one that everybody's complained about—it's an open algorithm. I mean, you can yeah. you can look at it, and dissect it, and sure. And, and, and all the main stuff. one that's been a concern is this dual ECDRBG algorithm, which was a NIST standard um, that many people thought it was a really silly way of doing things. That's a random issue. number. That's a random number generator, which could use to generate weak keys. Mm -hmm. If you knew the initial state of the random number generator. So there's been a lot of discussion about that, and, and as a result, NIST has reopened that standard for further comment so they can correct issues that they are there. But the, part of the discussion was, well, why was it approved in the first place? Right. And they had all these weaknesses built into it. So that's the one that, that everybody's right. on arms about right now. There's not been a specific saying, a specific notice saying AES is flawed. I mean, it was well reviewed in the competition, and even after the competition, it was further reviewed, and yeah. now it be pretty sound. Right. So, but again, there's the perception issue. I think that's really what yeah. we're dealing with. All right. Well, we're going to wrap it up. We're we're past our time. So thanks, Mike Hill, Keith Watson. I'm Preston Wiley. Have a safe and secure day.